This is my key map. There's a 34 key key map with a non qwerty layout, a custom symbols layer, home row mods, and still has all the functionality of a full sized 104 key keyboard. And today I will show you how my key map makes it all possible and the thought process behind designing it. If you're wondering why someone would even want to use a 34 key keyboard, you can check out my previous video. When designing a key map, the goal should be to put the most used keys in the most accessible spots. And today I will show you how I use this philosophy to design my key map. Key maps are all about the real estate. The closer the switches are located to your fingers, the more valuable their positions are. If a lower value is better, we can imagine a keyboard will look something like this. Now, if we rank the keys by order of usage, we'll probably get something like this. Note that mine may be different than yours, so I encourage you to rank them yourselves as well. Now, most of the keys are grouped logically, so that the similar keys are with each other, making it easier to remember where everything is. Within each group, there may be some disparity, but overall, it should give you a general idea of where things belong. Okay, so now we can start placing things on the keyboard. Let's start with the alpha keys. When you go to use a keyboard, you're most often using it to type letters, so it makes sense to put them in the center of the keyboard. Now for the actual arrangement of letters, I would suggest picking any layout other than QWERTY. This will be the biggest gain you could possibly make in your entire layout, because QWERTY is so bad and we have to type letters so often. To choose a layout, there are three ways you can go about it. One, master a bunch of layouts and see which one you like better. Two, read the design philosophies of the creators and see which one you like the most. Three, just pick a random one. Option one is pretty unrealistic for most people, though there are some people that have learned several layouts and can even switch between them while typing. Option two is a good choice if that's interesting to you, though I would suggest to focus specifically on the philosophies and not the metrics they use, since most layouts will make up new metrics to beat previous layouts. Obviously, if you design a layout around certain metrics, it should outperform other layouts in those metrics. Why you should care about those metrics is the important part. For me personally, I went with option three. I picked Workman basically at random. If you want a random layout, Colmac DH is one of the most popular ones. If you want to be adventurous, I would suggest taking a look into RSTHD. If you're interested in what learning a new layout is like, I talk about it in my previous two videos as well. Now we filled up most of the reachable keys on the keyboard with just the alphas already. The next most important keys are the numbers and the mods. Now, if you're using a 50% board, the placement of these keys would be pretty typical, but actually we can do better. Let's talk about layers. What if, instead of pressing one inconvenient key, we press two convenient keys? This is the concept behind layers, and you already use them whether you know it or not. The shift key on your keyboard acts like a layer key. If we never ever ever wanted to use layers, we would have two sets of alpha keys, one for the capital letters and one for the lowercase letters. Imagine how unwieldy a keyboard of that size would be. Similarly, why should we have to reach to the number row to type numbers? Why can't we just put numbers somewhere closer? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put numbers on a layer. We'll call this our number layer. Now, what shape you decide to make it is up to you. I personally prefer the num row, but others prefer num pads. If you're interested in what an optimal number row looks like, it would actually look something like this. Though I still use a regular num row since I haven't bothered to switch. Even just swapping four with one and seven with zero will be much better since zero and one are the most frequent numbers. Now we've decided how to arrange our number layer, how do we actually access it? While looking at the keys we have free, those thumb keys are looking pretty nice. For me personally, I use the secondary thumb key on my left hand to access my number layer, but it's up to your personal preference. Now, what about those pesky modifiers? Here's where we introduce our next concept, dual function keys. What do modifiers actually do? Well, by themselves, nothing really. When you just tap the key, nothing happens. It's only when you hold down the key and press another key that something actually will happen. So what if our modifiers could do something when we tap them and then act like the modifier when held? This is what mod tap does for us. And more specifically, we will use home row mods in which we put the modifiers on the home row. The home row mod setup I use is Windows, Alt, Control, Shift. The order in which you put the keys depends on your OS and preferences. For example, on Mac OS, you'll probably want to swap Windows, which is called Command, with Control. And depending on your preferences, you may want to swap Control with Shift because your index finger is actually responsible for three extra keys, meaning you will not be able to press those three keys with one hand only. You may be wondering why anyone would actually want to use home row mods in the first place though. Aren't the traditional mods good enough? Well, actually, they're pretty terrible when you think about it. Shift and control require you to stretch your pinky, and even worse, a lot of people only press the mods with their left hand, causing you to have to make weird contortions with your hand to reach them. Home row mods require no such hand movement, and is much more convenient than the traditional setup. The only downside is you'll often have to use both hands, which is more ergonomic, if sometimes less convenient. Though, if you wanted to do everything with one hand, you clearly don't care about ergonomics anyways. 
Now, as an aside, all of this keyboard is possible because this keyboard is running a firmware called QMK. If you're interested in the specifics, you can check out my keymap file in the description, and maybe I can make a more in-depth QMK specific video. Now we move on to the lesser used, but still important keys. Using the same principle, we can actually include tab and enter as layer tap keys on our secondary thumb keys. I also put backspace on the primary right thumb key as well. As for the symbols, we can expand our number layer to be called our number slash symbols layer, and there's actually enough room to cram almost all the symbol keys in there as well. Similarly to the alpha keys, we should also try and optimize the placements of the symbols themselves. Unlike alphas, however, there aren't many layouts made for you. That's because how you use the symbols is very dependent on what you do. For example, a writer will have wildly different preferences to a programmer, and even programmers that use different languages will have different preferences. So it's important to design your own setup. For me personally, I did a rough analysis of the most frequent symbols between prose and programming and put them on the home row. Then I took the next most frequent symbols from programming and placed them accordingly. Since I'm still in school and use a variety of programming languages, I used an average of all programming languages rather than picking one specifically. Now, for the rarely used keys, I have a navigation layer, which may look funky to most people, but that's because it's mimicking Vim keybinds, but in Workman. For most text editing slash coding, I use Vim, so I would just use those keys normally. But for the odd case when I'm not in Vim, I can just switch to the nav layer and get most basic functionality. Most programs require the mouse, so I've sort of given up on going mouseless for now, but that would be the most ideal setup. As for the rest of the keys, like F keys, you can just throw them on another layer. You can get a third layer with only two layer keys by using something called tri-layer activation, which basically allows you to activate a third layer when you hold the two layer keys down at the same time. Since these keys are so rarely used, it's not that big of a deal. Bonus. If you want a game on your keyboard, one way to do this without making custom keybinds for every single game you play is to have a gaming layer. The easiest way I've found is to create a shifted over QWERTY layer, basically adding in escape, control, and shift, and then sliding everything over to the right. That way you have WASD on ESDF, which lines up perfectly with your column stagger. So yeah, that's my key map. If you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comment below. This video took a lot longer than I expected because I was busy with school and building a new keyboard called the Ferris. It has a more aggressive pinky stagger than the Gergoplex and also has a USB-C port, which is nice. If you guys want me to make any other videos, let me know in the comments. I'm also working on a tool that can let you see how a layout feels without actually having to learn it. If you're interested, stick around on the channel to learn more.